Again, my name is Elijah. Uh, I work at a Pintu as a thank you. I work at a Pintu as a developer and a trainer. Uh, and today we're going to talk about exterminating common jQuery bugs. Um, when I mentioned this before, people are like, "Do you mean like bugs in jQuery Core?" And I'm like, "No, no, no. Like, jQuery Core team does a great job of addressing those type of bugs. These are more like bugs that we tend to write in our application code, um, and usually be just because we don't understand it yet." Um, and they're just things that we all that we all encounter uh, at one point or another. And so um, what we're going to do, like these are things you might see on Stack Overflow or the jQuery forums. Um, and so if you haven't seen these bugs, then hopefully you'll learn them. Uh, if you already know about them, we're also going to dig into some of the deep components of like why it's, why things are going wrong. So hopefully you'll learn that too. Um, so the the target that we're going to follow, or the plan we're going to follow is we're going to look at an example of markup and code. Uh, I'll run it, I'll explain what the developer intended to happen, um, and then I'll give you a couple seconds to look at the code to see if you could find the problem, and then I'll ex expose the problem, I'll highlight it, explain what's really going on, and then we'll exterminate it in, pr in the, we'll do it a couple ways. We'll first try to figure out what's the quickest way to solve the problem, and then I might show you other ways you could solve it as well. Uh, and then, it, in some cases, I'll show you some extra, like, here's something that's kind of cool that you should know. So, again, my name's Elijah Manor. I'm on Twitter at the bottom if you want to follow me. So the first one we're going to talk about, it, I call it the chicken or the egg problem. And um, it's a funny title, but the, um, the, the actual issue is something that a lot of developers have problems with, especially when they begin with jQuery. So Here's the actual example that we're going to take a look at. Uh, so here's the markup. It's going to be a, a table. And th this example is actually code that a friend of mine sent me. It's like, I have this problem. I can't figure it out. I wouldn't necessarily solve it this way, like have a table. And then the, w the way he solved it, I wouldn't necessarily do it the same way. But it's, it's real people having real problems. And how do, how do we solve it? So here's a table of jQuery board members. Each row is a board member. And he, uh, obviously his problem didn't have board members, but he had a delete button next to each item in this table. And when he clicked delete, he wanted to, um, so when, when he clicked the delete button, so this is pretty much what his code looked like. He was trying to grab the closest row. And he'd go up the DOM and find the closest row and find the ID attribute and see what the ID is. And then he had an Ajax call which would go to his backend server and try to delete that particular item in his database. And he had two callbacks, a success callback and a complete. Uh, the success one, if it, if it actually came back, if it was successful, data success, then he would take that row that he had in a jQuery object, uh, he would hide it, which is the animation. You know, once you provide an um, either slow or fast or a number, it's actually an animated hide. Uh, and then when that hide finished, he actually r removed it from the screen. And then he actually had this zebra table function, which would you know do the alternating colors. And again, you probably wouldn't solve it this way. You might use CSS or another technique, but just go with me. There's still a bug here that we need to find. So the intent was he would click delete, it would delete it, and then he would re zebrify so it looked right. But if we run this code, we'll see uh, the list that we have, and hopefully you can see the alternating colors. Yeah, you can. And so the bug was like if he deleted Corey. Sorry, Corey, if you're in the audience, but um, it would re-zebrify, but you notice it's kind of off here. Uh, and if I deleted Dave, you can, sorry Dave, um, it just gets all funkified, right? And so I'm going to give you just a couple seconds to see if you could find the problem. Again, I can't give you too long. Usually this is better interactive, but we only have 30 min minutes or so. So see if you could see something a little fishy. Yeah, the IDs uh, isn't really the problem here. It's more of, it's, it's a synchronous versus asynchronous type of problem. Um, so I highlighted the, the problem code. Uh, what's really happening, and what you should know as when you're dealing with Ajax, success and error happen when it comes back from the server. Complete, the complete callback, always happens at the very end. So if it's successful, complete happens after that. If it's an error, complete always hap happens after that. So what this developer was thinking is, okay, I'll take my row, I'll hide it, and then I'll remove it, 
and then it, he thinks jQuery will call Zebra at the very end. But that's not really happening. Uh, this row hide is really asynchronous, it's, it's an animation. Um, and so the remove will only happen after a half a second has transpired. Like this whole, this piece of code and this piece of code don't run synchronously. So what, the, what was really happening, the animation was starting, so we're basically kicking off the animation, and then jQuery says, okay, I'm done with success, I'm gonna call the complete. He was re zebrifying the table before he actually deleted it. And then after the half a second happened, then it would go and remove it. So it was kind of in the wrong order. Um, and again, this is a common, common issue when you're doing with synchronous and asynchronous code. Um, some other common problems that you have with synchronous and asynchronous, especially for a beginner, um, we'll look at that in a second, but if synchronous, you just think like, code's running, it finishes, then I'm gonna run next piece of code, it finishes, go to the next. So an example of that, I'm gonna make a new div in thin air, add a class to it, and then it waits till that's done, and then I'm gonna append it to the DOM. So that's synchronous, it will wait for each one. Some common asynchronous techniques, and you're aware of this Ajax asynchronous, when I kick it off, it's not gonna immediately, I kick off the thing, it's not gonna immediately do the console log right after that. It's actually gonna go to the next code that's after that, and at some point in time, it will fire this, this callback. Uh, one more slightly hard bug to spot is an example of combining animation methods with normal jQuery methods. So here we have a header. We tell it to fade out slowly and then we tell it to remove it. Um, I see this problem quite often. So the developer thinks that it will only remove it after the fade out's complete, but that's not, that's not the case. It doesn't work that way. So what really happens is it starts the animation process and then you know, maybe five milliseconds later it will remove it and it won't actually wait till it was complete. So what you'll actually see is, you won't really see the animation, you'll just see it removing from the screen completely. So that's another thing to be aware of. There's ways to fix that we could talk about later. But. And another common example of a synchronous code is just event handling. You know, obviously when you're wiring this up it's not gonna immediately you know, call something. So some event has to happen and then the control flow will come into our event. So, so to fix our problem, and it's not, the, it's not the prettiest of all, and again, we'd probably solve this problem completely differently, but we would zebra the table after we removed it. Um, because we're starting the animation, and the hide method takes a second parameter, which tells you when it's completed. That's when we remove the row, and then if we re-zebrify, uh, it will behave appropriately, and we could e even take out the complete. That wasn't necessary, and it was actually causing the bug. So now if we delete Cory, it zebrifies after I delete it, and if we delete Dan and all these other people, it, it works fine. So again, the problem was kind of weird, but the underlying reason of knowing the difference between synchronous and asynchronous code was really the problem there. The next piece um, I call Give Me Truth. And uh, the markup that we're gonna look for this one is just a simple div. We're gonna build a, a, a teeny little module that basically uses jQuery UI dialog. And I wanna have an init and an open method. And so I wanna be, be able to call init as many times as I want, and only the very first time when, it, when it's not initialized will it actually initialize itself. So the developer who wrote this first grabbed an instance of that, that div and then they were basically saying, hey, does that div exist in the DOM? Because obviously you don't want to initialize something that doesn't exist yet. And then they were using the not method saying, hey, has that div, does it, does it not have this class name? And for those of you who have used jQuery UI widgets, it usually adds a lot of classes to your stuff. So he was basically saying, is it there? And it has it not been initialized. And then if so, then you know, call the constructor method of the, the widget and get it ready to be called. And then the, the open method just goes ahead and gets that instance and says, hey, open yourself. So the code seems not too problematic, but when we run it, so that what this code's doing is called init, it's calling init, open, and then we're calling init again because it shouldn't init itself twice. But what we see is that it, it init itself the first time, it opens it, but then when we call init again, it's, it's still getting into that code. Um, and really as a developer, you don't, there's no reason to reinitialize something. So let's just take a couple of seconds to see if, if there's actually two problems with this at least. Um, 
see if you can spot it, and then we'll talk about. And this is a common problem that actually a very large websites uh, make, and um, if you open up, I, I've seen it several times in very large websites. So anyway, the, the bug is trying to check for the existence and to see if it hasn't been initialized yet. As you see here, we're testing the jQuery object itself, because here we, we had got the selector. Uh, that is actually problematic, like that's really not helping us at all. And this method is not really doing probably what we thought it would do. The reason both of those are problems is because we were testing the jQuery object for truthiness, and that helps us in no way to figure out if it actually selected anything on the page. Um, and this goes back to the idea of truthy and falsy in JavaScript. Um, the, the things that are considered falsy when they're evaluated are false, null, undefined, empty string, zero, negative zero, and not a number. Now, a jQuery object is not any of those things. So if I tested the truthiness of an object, even if it's empty object, it's always gonna be true, regardless if it found anything on the page that matched that. So that's that problem. The second one, the not method, does not do what you think it should do, which is not cool. Um, what it essentially does, you give it a selector, and it basically filters out the internal collection of things that you know don't match that. So it's the developer who made this was thinking it would turn a Boolean, but that's not the case. So the easiest way to fix this one without totally rewriting everything is taking the, the modal and say, hey, there's a dot length off the jQuery object, and it tells you how many things it found. So I'm gonna say, hey, is the link you know, basically greater than zero, which is a truthy. Um, so that helps me to know, is it on the page, does it exist? And then I'm gonna use the is method, which is, is probably what I wanted to do, um, where I pass the selector and it will tell me true or false, does it match the things in my internal collection? So by rewriting it, just really small changes, we'll rerun the code. I'm calling init, I'm calling open, and I call init again as many times as I want, and you see it's never getting into that piece of code, which is, which is probably what we wanted. I call this one animation has gone wild. It's kind of, it's a fun one. So, um, and again, you, you might have seen this if you've done anything with animations beyond really simple stuff. But it's a common problem. And again, large websites have this problem and usually they fix it quickly because it's a very annoying. But we're gonna build a simple little menu. Um, the markup looks kind of like this where we have list items. Here we have a browser, we hover over browser and we see Firefox and Chrome and all that jazz. Uh, the code looks really simple. And again, it's really simple to get animation going, but um, you can run into some interesting problems. Here we're gonna use hover, the helper uh, event method. It takes one of the uh, overloads, overloads takes two methods when you hover over and when you basically leave it, enter and leave. So if we run this piece of code, it kinda looks like it's working fine at, at the beginning. Like, hey, it's great, yay. But then you get some, some I don't know what you would call this person, hyperactive person who like moves their mouse really quick like this and then they move off and they're like, what's going on? <laughs> um, and like, I'm like, I'm not even gonna wait for this to finish because who knows when that will finish. And if you look at the code, it's like, it's not obvious that there's something going on here, but, and so I'm not really gonna wait seven seconds, that's the magic number I wait. Um, but these are the lines of code that are problem. Um, now all the animation methods, the, the helper ones, like slide down, slide up, toggle, uh, and animate, which is the low level version, they all have this internal queuing mechanism uh, where it's queuing up all the animations you want. And as long as you are interacting with each other, it will wait till that animation's complete, pop it off, go to the next animation. And it's kind of doing what you expect it to do. I want this nice flow of animation. Um, but sometimes you just want it to stop, like stop it. Um, and, and it's not an obvious thing, like I'm gonna look for the stop method. You kind of have to know it's there. Um, but thankfully there is a stop method. Um, it, y you could tell it which queue, but m most people don't even know how to make their own queue, but internally FX is a queue, and you don't have to provide that, it's optional. But there's two nice uh, parameters, clear queue and jump to end. So clear queue me means, hey, I know maybe there's 10 other animations in, in, in the line, but hey, they just moused out, and, or moused leaved, and I don't wanna do all that rest of the junk. Like, just clear it out, like wipe it out. Um, which is, solves half of our problem, the other half of our problem is the jump to the end, the, the third parameter. And it basically says, hey, if I'm in the middle of animating, like if I'm sliding sliding up and you say clear out the world, why don't you go ahead and finish your animation, like kind of jump to the end where you were gonna end up anyway? 
Um, and that if you set a true to the, this third one, that's kind of what that does. Otherwise, you might have an animation that's halfway, and that's not necessarily what you want. Sometimes you don't need the third one. Sometimes you do. It depends on the type of problem you're dealing with. Um, but so a way to clean this one up, and technically you don't have to have it in both places, but uh, I'll say stop true true before I actually do, say, slide toggle or slide up. If we look at this one, if I get crazy with it, it's not, and then let go, it's, you know, it doesn't do all that cubing crap. Now, there's, it still is kind of really fidgety, like, what in the world? Like, you might have a seizure or something, I don't know. Um, so let's, well, actually, this is not fixing the seizure yet, we'll do that in a minute. Um, but this one's kind of fun, like, um, so instead of having two event handlers, this code's really redundant. Like, the only thing different is, oh, actually, actually that's a that shouldn't be there. Um, if you only provide one event handler, then when you enter and leave it, it'll basically run this piece of code no matter which one. And there's actually a slide toggle, and it kind of figures out, do I need to slide it up or slide it down? And it figures that out based on its current state. Um, I like the easing algorithms, and if you haven't used them, they're really cool. Like, here, I'm using ease out bounce here, and I'll show you what that looks like. It goes doing oing, doing oing. You can kind of see it bounce. It's even cooler when you Let's open this up. Oh, sync, that didn't work. So uh, jQuery core comes with the swing algorithm and linear. So linear just follows a really boring path. Ooh. Swing is a little bit cooler because it follows the path and it slows down a little bit at the end. It's like, oh, that's kind of cool. But if you get jQuery UI, there's all these fancy ones. Like, I love this one that goes doink, 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 doink. That's my favorite. So you can have fun with that if you have the jQuery UI. And if you like math, uh, you can make your own. That's cool. So, um, so I, I know she, like, you, the seizure thing, uh, you know, when you w wig out. We can solve that in a couple ways. One, I'm going to show you using the hover intent plugin. It's kind of old, but it serves a purpose. And again, we have to kind of repeat our code. It's a little, this should really say slide down. <laughs> Sorry about that. But it actually does the right thing. But it's a little redundant, but it kind of fixes that problem where we're like, mm. it kind of waits until it's a, s a sane number of milliseconds before it actually opens it up. So you don't get that weird, crazy behavior. Um, now, I don't like repeating myself too much, and this code looks very similar. So I'm going to use the same mechanism, but I'm going to use Ben Allman's do timeout plugin to kind of have a little bit smarter code. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to listen for the mouse enter and leave on all the list items. If I've entered the list item, I'm going to start a, a basically start a timer. So the do timeout is um, plugin is just a nice wrapper around set timeout. Set timeout's a little hokey uh, the way the API. So he made a nice plugin to abstract some of that hokiness. So I'm going to say start a timer if you've entered it. I'm going to click call it delay toggle, and um, I'm going to say hey, if a half a second has happened since they've entered that little menu, then go ahead and kick off this method. Um, if they were going really crazy fast and it, was, it didn't wait to 500 milliseconds, then this will be, this will be fired. We'll hit the else statement because it's the mouse leave and I'll still toggle the menu, but I'll say cancel um, the, the delay timeout. Don't actually do what you wanted to do. Um, and then my toggle menu, I'm just doing a little fancy code. I don't really like um, I'm not fond of slide toggle. I usually want to control if you're opening it or closing it. Um, and you could get in some weird problems. It, like it's always consistently doing the opposite of what you always want to do, and that's kind of weird. So here I'm actually figuring out in code uh, what to call dynamically. Uh, you can kind of ignore that. You can look at the slides later. But um, it's just a nice, using his plugin really opens up a lot of flexibility of things you can do, which is really nice. And just to prove it works the same way, um, you know, I got and then it waits until I kind of stop to do it. I call this uh, defective data. Technically, it's not really defective, but uh, you could get it, if you don't understand really what's going on, you could get some weird like head scratches or, you know, I'm losing hair type things. And so we're going to create this nice little plugin uh, that works off buttons. And if you click a button, and you use this plugin we're going to write. It says, hey, are you sure you want to do that? You know, one of those really annoying things, right? So we have a button. 
and we're going to have an HTML5 attribute saying, are you sure you want to do this? You know, and then you have your, your button. So, so here's our uh, plugin. We call it confirm action. You know, again, this is standard plugin stuff. We're not really, th the intent is not to talk about how to make a plugin, but one of the things in the plugin, will, it'll grab the, the data attribute, um, and then it does a bunch of stuff with namespaced events, yada, yada, whatever. Uh, and then at, at some point or another, I actually take my custom plugin and I say, all buttons on the screen, confirm yourself. And so it wires everything up, and when people click on it, it shows up. But then you're like, oh, stink, that very first button, I meant for it to say something else. And so you grab the first button, you unbind all the namespace event events on that button. Uh, and if you don't know namespace events, they're awesome. Check it out sometime. Um, and then we're going to say, okay, I really want to change the, the question to are you really, really sure you want to submit? Because obviously that's a lot more clear, and this is a very, very serious. Um, and so then we, um, we call confirm action again to wire all that up. So if we run this code, submit custom, you sure you want, that's not even English, I think it's like, I don't know, whatever. But it's not saying really, really, because I really, really wanted to say really, really, and you're like, oh, stink, there's a bug in data. Um, so anyway, take a couple seconds, see if you find what's wrong. There's actually two kind of, there's one bug, and then there's one thing that's not optimal, and we'll look at how to fix that in a minute. All right. So there's two lines of code. This one's the suboptimal piece. Uh, it still works, but we'll talk about how it's suboptimal later. But the real problem with this is we're using the ATTR uh, method to change the HTML5 data attribute. It se might seem like a sane thing to do. It's like, well, I stuck that on the, the button, data confirm text. Why not, why doesn't it work if I, if I use that? Well, to answer my question, <laughs> or your question, um, Dave uh, Methan had a really great blog post that explained this in a lot more in detail than I'm going to. Uh, it's on learningjquery.com. But uh, essentially what he said is um, the dot .data API reads the HTML5 data attributes and it does it only one time. So for example, if you call data, it, data uh, the data method, it will suck in all those attributes. But if you change the attributes and then called it again, it's not going to read the data attributes a second time. It's going to be like, I already read these, why do it again? I'm going to read my internal values. And so essentially we're not getting the new, uh, the new information. The way to solve this, the easiest way to solve this is just not use ATTR, use data. Uh, and say, hey, I want you to update the confirmed text data to are you really, really, really sure? Uh, and you notice I, I mentioned this was um, not optimal. If you notice before, I used the dash, the confirm dash text. It works, but it's um, not really optimal. In jQuery 1.6, uh, they changed the way they deal with these data HTML5 attributes to conform to the W3C HTML5 specification. That's a lot of words, but <laughs> that just means um, internally, like the, the native APIs to get at that information don't use dashes. They use like camel casing. And so um, if you still, still do use the dashes, what jQuery will do is it'll first, it'll try to get that information using the dashes, and if that doesn't work, then it'll actually rip out the dashes and camel case it for you, uh, which is obviously not optimal, because that's one more thing that jQuery has to do, and it's going to slow down your code. Um, a lot of words, but just um, try to use camel casing. So instead of confirm dash text, take out the dash, uppercase the T, and you're good to go. An extra aside that uh, the data method does for you, it actually does some automatic type conversions, which is kind of cool. So if you use these data, uh, HTML5 data attributes, it will actually pull in and try to figure out what type you meant it to be. Um, so for example, obviously strings aren't very exciting, but if you said math-data equals true, then when it reads it in, uh, button.data-math, it will actually be a uh, Boolean, which is nice. Up here, if I have an array of items, when the data reads that in, it will actually be an array. So I could call dot length on it, and it could be, have the appropriate value, because there's plus minus um, multiplication. Uh, numbers, it, it, it's numbers, and if you actually put JSON in here, uh, it'll actually parse that into an object. So you could actually call uh, properties off your objects. So if you didn't know that, it's kind of nice. Now some people don't like this, and like, I don't want it to convert my types. Um, so if you really do not like that, then that's where you can use the ATTR 
and it will always return the string uh, version. So, yippee. Um, yeah, so here's an interesting one that um, semi new developers on the front end, they'll g get to a certain point and they're like, oh, this is not working. Uh, and they'll, I don't know what they'll do, but anyway. So let's say you have a method that you have in some object or something, and you want to use that as an event handler on, you know, when you pass to jQuery. And it seems like a, a sane thing to do, but you can get in some problems if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, so here's our markup. We got a label, um, attendee name, and we have an input, which is a nice text box, and then a button that says register. Um, and then we have this nice constructor. It's a, a conference constructor, and it knows it's the name of the conference, and it knows how many attendees it has. And we have a register method off the conference. And basically, it tries to figure out you know, the value of what you typed in. It shoves it into the attendees. And it console logs, thank you, for, thank you for registering. Have a nice day. It doesn't say that, but I added that. And then it clears it out. Even This is too many things happening in this method, but just go with me here. Uh, and then, so the developer's like, hey, great. So I'm going to take the register button and say on click and give it this method, because that's awesome. I already have it written, and wouldn't it be nice to use it? So if I run this, Elijah, I want to attend this JavaScript conference. And then kapow, we get this nice error. Uh, cannot call push up undefined, which is not very helpful. Well, actually, it is, if you know what it means. But it could be, <laughs> if you know what it means, you're like, that's great. I don't know. So what will, ah, oh, stink. I showed you the answer. Um, <laughs> seven seconds. Pretend you didn't see that. Thank you. Okay, I'm not going to wait. You already know. So the problem code is here. And actually, technically, I should have highlighted this piece of code down here as well. Um, boop, right there. But the bug's happening right here. Um, and if we remember the error, it's, what is the error? So push is not, there's no push method on undefined. So essentially what, it, what that means is like, it's looking for push. So apparently this dot, this dot attendees is undefined. I'm like, it shouldn't be, you know, it's a, it's an internal array of this object. And you're kind of scratching your head and you're like, whatever, JavaScript stinks. And, um, <laughs> but there's a nice way to solve this. Um, so the, the reason is a problem to, to explain the reason. Um, when you click on a button and have a callback, jQuery says, hey, I'm the, this, uh, this pseudo parameter inside of your method that I'm about to call, it will be the element, DOM element, that you just clicked on, which seems like a normal good thing to do. But in this case, I wanted this, this pseudo parameter to be the conference so I could push on uh, attendees and things like that. So, hmm, that's not good. Um, so th uh, as of jQuery 1.4, a long time ago, uh, they added a jQuery proxy method, which there are other ways to solve this problem, but it was such a common problem in the industry that they made this uh, method. And you could basically control what the, this uh, key pseudo keyword will be, pseudo parameter. And th so the way to fix it, I don't have to change this code at all. I just, when I s register the on, I'll say dollar sign proxy, I said, I want you to call this method. And by the way, when you say this up here, I really want you to be talking about the conference and not the button I just clicked. Thank you. Goodbye. And then that fixes it. I can say Elijah, manner, with no space. That's awesome. And it says, thank you for registering. There's one person registered. So that fixes that problem. There's actually lots of ways you can fix this. And some of these examples are kind of silly because it's a little overkill for what we're doing. But I could have had a function uh, callback and then manually said conference.register passing in the event. That would have fixed it. I could have actually called the call method off of a function and call or apply is a common way to control the, this keyword. Now this is a little silly because I'm saying conference here and then passing conference in here. Um, it's kind of silly, but you should be aware that there are many ways to control the this parameter of a function that's about to be called um, other than using the proxy. A uh, proxy didn't have to be implemented, but it was just a really nice, convenient way. And we could actually use the ECMAScript 5 bind method, which not, not all browsers have that. So you could use a, use a shim, H, HTML5, or ECMAScript 5 shim, but whatever. OK, we're going to we have two more points uh, in five minutes. Let's go. So uh, I call this erratic events. This is a stupid to-do app. Of course, you always have to have a to-do app, right? 
uh, each list item has a checkbox and an anchor. Uh, and then we actually, any if you click anywhere in the unordered list, I want to tell you when it was last updated. It's kind of a silly thing to do. Oops, that's not what I wanted. So here's the code. I'm going to grab the unordered list. And anytime anybody clicks on anything inside that unordered list, it could be the list items or it could be the anchor, it could be whatever, I want to print out the date. Uh, and then if they click on the anchor, I want to simulate pulling information from the server, maybe show a nice modal dialog with information about that to do. And I don't want to go to the href, so I'm going to, this developer returns false. And then if they click the input checkbox, oops, sorry, um, then I will basically simulate going to Ajax, saying it's been checked and come back from the server. So if we run this code, I could click anywhere in the unordered list, so I'm clicking here and here and here. And the date's changing. It might be too dark. Sorry about that, but the little numbers are changing. That's what I want. Uh, I'm, I'm clicking on a checkbox here. The number did update. I don't know if you saw that. 46, now it's 51. Now the problem is if I click on one of these anchors, it's actually doing what I intended, but it's not updating the time. So it's always 51. So that's a problem because I want to always show the date of the last time someone interacted, which is a silly thing. But anyway, I'm not going to give you seven seconds because I have three minutes left. But the problem is the return false. And you might already know this, but if you don't, I, there's a lot of developers that unfortunately don't seem to know this yet. So hopefully you'll learn it today. So the idea of event delegation, we were listening to everything that happened in that unordered list. They could click on the anchor, the list item, anywhere in the body of the unordered list. And those events actually bubble up the tree, the DOM tree. So uh, I should have shown this on the anchor, but if I clicked on an input element, it would say, hey, anybody listening for clicks on me? You go ahead and fire, and then it goes up to the its parent, the list item. Hey, anybody listening for clicks on me? Execute yourself. And it goes up to the unordered list. Hey, anybody listening? So it kind of does that all the way to the document. Um, unfortunately, the return false was breaking that behavior, so it never got up to the unordered list where I was listening for everything. Um, and so it was breaking our code. Uh, the way to fix this problem is there's something called event or prevent default. So if this is helpful for like anchors or when you're submitting forms, you don't really want necessarily want it to redirect to a different page or submit the data to the server. You might do validation or you're maybe you're just, you know, you want to hijack it and do something really cool. So prevent default solves that problem. And it doesn't break the code. It still lets the events bubble up to its parent. So that seems like kind of a simple fix, right? So we go in here. I could click the eat, and then the numbers show up. And I could click in anywhere else, and all the numbers show up. Um, there's a stop propagation, which that's really the method that prevents the events from bubbling up to its parents in the tree. Uh, really, return false is just basically doing both of these. It's telling don't go where you want to go, don't do what you want to do, and also, by the way, don't let any parents know what you did either because, you know, we're being secret around the house. Um, but people abuse the return faults thinking, hey, I just don't want it to go somewhere, and they don't realize they might be breaking code that's actually delegating at a different point in time or uh, somewhere up the chain. Uh, and the more you code and get better uh, at making large websites, the more you want to delegate some of these things to make it more performant. So last thing, I have one minute. Uh, I wrote this really long blog post about the difference between bind and live and delegate and on, because that's a lot of stuff. And if you don't know all the history, you might not know all the stuff. So people says, hey, Elijah, I, uh, I, took, I took the live method, which you know is being deprecated, and there's lots of problems with it, and I switched to, uh, to on, but it broke everything. And I'm like, hmm. So let's take a look at what that developer might be thinking. So we have an unordered list of list items, and we have a button to add a new item to that list. So they have this live code here. So they had, we're grabbing all the list items. They said live, uh, and then said click, and they had code. And so they're like, oh, great, I, I need to use on instead. And so they switch the live with on, and then everything breaks. So they could click on things that did exist, yay, add a new item, but nothing's hap oh, stink. Nothing, nothing's happening. Of course, you can't tell. It's off the screen. When I click the new item, and they're like, Elijah, you told me wrong. Um, 
so the problem is the way they did the on. Um, on is great, but there's some things that it does. Like on is kind of overloaded, and I use air quotes because it's technically it's not overloaded. But depending on how you call it, what parameters and what order it behaves differently, um, which is um, there's a lot of pros. It simplifies the code base, a lot of uniformity, uh, lots of goodness. Uh, but I see a lot of people confused of how to use it. So the way we fix this, um, instead of live, we do use on. The way live works, you might not have known this, but it basically stores a bunch of metadata and sticks it on the document. And as we talked about, events delegate up the chain. <coughs> they bubble up. And eventually, they get the document sometime. And then jQuery says, hey, someone clicked on some anchor way down here. Is there any information in this metadata that is looking for a click on that particular element? Oh, yes, there is. I'm going to invoke yourself. Thank you. Um, and so if we want to simulate that, then we will select the document and say, hey, I want to stick all the metadata on the document with this information. And then it just magically works. Now, here's a quick cheat sheet of how to convert from the old methods to the new ones. So everyone knows that the click well, maybe not everyone. The click is just a wrapper around binds. So if I have looking for all the anchors and say click, it's really just a bind click. If we want to convert th these methods to an on, then it is simple as just replacing bind with an on. And that's why the old code was broken, because it was binding only the things at that point in time. If we have a live, almost done, it's last slide, second last slide. Uh, the live one we showed in this how to convert that in, in the previous one. We have to change it to the document. That's where the information is being stored, the metadata. And then we say on click and whatever. Th if you're already using delegate, it's really easy to swap it over. Everything stays the same, but you just swap these two parameters. Uh, and that might seem kind of silly at first, but it really keeps everything really consistent. So it's on click for bind type things, on click for live type things, and on click for delegate type things. It just really depends if you have two parameters or three. Uh, and live and delegate, just whatever is here is where all that metadata is stored. Again, there's a huge blog post I got in more detail if you want to look at it. And some people are like, I'm not going to use live, or I'm not going to use all these other methods, uh, on method, because, I don't know, I'm just going to keep using delegate or bind. Behind the scenes, this is the jQuery source code. Behind the scenes, everything calls on anyway. So why don't you use it? B bind uses on, a live uses on, delegate uses on, unbind is just a one-liner to off, die is just a one-liner to off, undelegate is a one-liner to off. So why don't you use on? <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't have time. I'm over time. Sorry. Um, I'll put, post this up. There's a couple of points I, I cut off, so I'll put all the points on my website and have it available for the, the post. Hopefully you learned something. Thanks. <laughs>